Any questions about anything before we start? I mean, I'm a little worried about Manish because this is like two times in a row. I haven't seen him. <laughs> Any questions? Alex, Nathan, Rohit, question? You had your hand up. <laughs> that is so not my thing, the 3030 stuff. It's any other questions? What's your favorite transform? My favorite transform? Holy moly. Let's see. Probably the continuous time Fourier transform. You know. Yeah. What's your favorite transformer? I'm not good at those those kind of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or superhero movies or anything like that. It's like, unfortunately. I couldn't tell Iron Man from whatever. <laughs> I know the name of Iron Man. <laughs> Isn't Iron Man uh, Robert Downey Jr.? Is, yeah. yeah. I loved his. <laughs> I loved his Sherlock Holmes movie. Yes. It, yes. That was really good. That was really good. Although I never visualized Watson to look like Jude Law. You know. Yeah. Now Watson should look more like a professor. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that one as what? Well. That's the Benedict Cumberbatch one, right? Any other questions? Oh, by the way, we have a visitor today. I, I'm, I'm not going to point her out because I'll embarrass her. She's a prospective Cornell student. But we don't always talk this way in, in the beginning of class, you know. It's, just to get everybody loosened up, you know, just every now and then it's good. Wait for people to arrive. Okay. All right, so anyway. We actually had a visitor last time as well, you know, and he, I, I didn't even know he was here until the end. I saw a face out there that I wasn't familiar with, but that's no telling that it's a person in the class you know, <laughs> just never seen before. There's always a few new faces at the final. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, we pretty much finished up the, the sampling theorem stuff, most of it. And today what I want to do is, first part of the class, I want to talk about the, the last thing having to do with sampling, which is, which is pulse sampling. So one final item is this thing that we call pulse sampling and time division multiplexing. And after we're done with that, we're going to move on to the next sort of segment of the class which has to do with the, the DFT and the FFT. The DFT is uh, it, what's, that's short for discrete Fourier transform. No one really calls it the discrete Fourier transform anymore. They just call it the DFT. The FFT is a collection of algorithms for computing that fast. And in a sense, that's what MATLAB is doing when it works with signals. It's using DFTs and FFTs all over the place. And so we're going to talk about that for a while. But first, this final item, pulse sampling and time division multiplexing. And, and I want to define a signal to start with. So first, I'm going to define the signal capital pi. And I think I put a line under it last time I thought about it. You know, and I, I'm just going to leave it that way as the, as the signal with specification. pi of t equals the sum over all n of p sub a of t minus n capital T for all little t, where capital T is given positive number and a is another positive number that's significantly less than capital T. So what is this thing? Pi is a pulse train. It's a train of rectangular pulses of width A centered at integer multiples of T. So this is pi of T versus T. It has a pulse of height 1 and width A centered at 0. And then one out here at cap T, 
1 at 2t, so on. Goes the same in the negative t direction. So these are all of height 1 and width a. So that's what pi of t is. And the reason I'm calling it pi capital pi of t is that the capital pi sort of looks like one of those pulses. Okay. Given a signal x, continuous time signal x, and again, we're just going to assume for ease of exposition that all the signals we're dealing with are complex valued. So given x in c to the, z, c to the r, you can form z equals x times pi. So you take the signal x, you multiply by the signal pi, and you get another continuous time signal z. And we call z a pulse sampled version of x. Okay. So what is the idea of z? z of t, so note, z is z of t is equal to x of t over the support intervals of the pulses. So over the t values where the pulses happen, where the pulses are non-zero. And z of t is equal to zero for all other t. Thus, for example, if this is what x looks like, so if x of t looks like this, and that looks pretty much like the one I always draw, right, for, for an x of t, then z of t is going to look like this. It's going to have a little piece of x around time 0, a little piece of x around time cap t, another little piece of x around time cap 2t, and so on. And same deal going on over here. So that's z of t. And remember, when we, when we passed a continuous time signal x through a t sampler, we actually got a discrete time signal out, a signal who, that had a discrete set of values that are values of x exactly at sampling time z, in some sense, is a kind of a softening of that. It's another continuous time signal that looks like x around integer multiples of cap t and is 0 otherwise. OK, so this is a pulse sampled version of x. Now it turns out that if you look at what's happening in the frequency domain, if the conditions of the sampling theorem apply, namely if x is band limited, and if t is slow enough with respect to the bandwidth, that is to say, 2 pi over t is faster than the Nyquist rate for x, then from z you can actually reconstruct x completely. So how is that going to work? So let's look at the spectrum. Spectrum of z in particular. How do we do that? First, z is a decent periodic signal. So z, z, or pi itself, is a decent capital T periodic signal. Thus, we can expand it in a Fourier series. So we can expand pi in a Fourier series. That looks like this. I of t equals the sum over all k of ck e to the j k 2 pi over t times t for all t. And of course, we know that since, since pi has jumps, it actually converges to the value across the jump. But for all t, we don't really care what happens at the jumps. What is c0 here? Tell me what c0 is, somebody. 
one half. What do you think it is, Ricardo? Oh, whatever the value is at the center. They're all of height one and width a. It's equal to one. What if I make a really small? Okay, it's the it's the average value of z, right? Or the average value of pi is what c zero is. And if I look at pi over one period, say from minus t over two to t over two, I have one pulse captured in there, right? The pulse has area a times one or a, and that interval is t long. So c zero equals. <laughs> Let's get some agreement here. A over t, who's, okay, Stephen, good job. So note, c0 equals a over t. That's the only one we're going to really care about. You can figure out what the rest of them are pretty easily. They're all like sinks of whatever. All right. Now, from this Fourier series, so in any event, z is equal to x pi. So z has specification, z of t equals the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of ck x of t e to the j k 2 pi over t t. So far so good? So what is the spectrum of z? What is z hat of omega? We can use one of our rules for Fourier transforms the frequency shift rule. So by the frequency shift rule, z hat of cap omega is the sum over all k of ck x hat of omega minus k 2 pi over t. Now, we've seen a sum like that before. When we were doing the deconstruction equation, the intermediate expression capital F of omega was a sum of scaled shifted replicas of x hat, but it wasn't, they weren't even scaled. They were just that, that sum. And there was a plus in here that doesn't make any difference. Now we have the C case. That's the only difference between this and the F of omega. Okay, so thus, like the f of omega earlier, z hat is a sum of scale shifted replicas of x hat. And actually, I should be using xc for this, but, I'm, but uh, do you want me to go back and put subscripts on all those? Let's just stay with this sum of scale shifted replicas of x hat centered at at omega values of the form k2 pi over t for k in the integers. And you know that if you do that, if you take shifted replicas of x hat centered at integer multiples of k2 pi over t, integer multiples of 2 pi over t, and the conditions of the sampling theorem are satisfied, those shifted replicas will not collide, right? Actually, what I'm going to do is, as soon as we encounter an x on these boards, I'm going to change it to an xc, just so I'm being uniform in the notation for continuous time signals. And I'll point that out whenever I'm doing it, so that if you happen to be taking notes, you can go back and fix it accordingly. So as before, if x happens to be band-limited, say with bandwidth 
omega m star and 2 pi over t, which is the frequency of pi, the, the sampling pulse train, is bigger than twice that bandwidth, 2 omega m star, the Nyquist rate for x. And did I, did I use the words Nyquist rate last time? OK, this is, this is uh, a bit of terminology. Let me put this over here. I should have told you this. Terminology when xc has bandwidth omega m star, it's band limited, has that as bandwidth, we call 2 omega m star the Nyquist rate for xc. So if xc is band limited to, and has band with, band with omega m star, and 2 pi over t is bigger than 2 omega m star, then the replicas of xc hat in z hat don't collide. So for example, if xc hat looks like this, as usual, a little triangle out to omega m minus omega m, and say it has height capital A, just for the heck of it. David. Omega m star to omega m star. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not the width of the picture. It's how far out it goes, max and absolute value. Gotcha. Okay. Some courses, some, some it, it depends on what you know, you're studying. They define bandwidth a little differently. OK. Like sometimes we, so, some courses will talk only about positive frequency, and, and they'll talk about the bandwidth in positive frequency, which is half the, you know, whatever. But in this class, bandwidth means the smallest value of omega m such that the interval minus omega m to omega m encloses all the activity in x. Okay? So if xc hat looks like that, then z hat looks like this. It's going to have one of these around omega equals zero. And what is the height going to be? The height is going to be little a over t times capital A. Then it's going to have 1 at 2 pi over t. And that's going to be of height C1 times capital A. And this is supposed to go out to the same distance here. And here's pi over t in here. So pi over t bigger than omega m star is the same as 2 pi over t bigger than 2 omega m star. And then there may be even some ones that point down, you know, like this. Say this might be c2, a, and this would be 4 pi over t. And the same thing going on over here. c minus 1 times a. OK, so that goes on. But all we care about is this one in the middle. Because from this picture, remember z is a continuous time signal. From this picture, I claim it should be clear how to recover x. What do you do? What do you do with z to get x back? Victor. You just pass it through a low pass filter. You pass it through a low pass filter. Because if you have the low pass filter, say, that cuts off at plus and minus pi over t, that kills all the frequency content in z out there and leaves this one in here. And if you have the amplitude of that low pass filter appropriately, you can get x straight out. So thus, from this pulse sample version z, we can recover all of x simply by low pass filtering. And of course, we have to approximate that because low pass filters aren't buildable, but that's something that we assume you can do. So from this picture, from the graph, you can see that, that if you put z into a system that has 
frequency response h hat of omega, and I'll tell you what that is in the system. In a second, you get xc out. h hat of omega is equal to whatever undoes the at times capital A, so it's going to be t a or t t over a times little a when omega is less than or equal to pi over t and zero when omega is bigger than pi over t in absolute value. So the bottom line is that even when you do pulse sampling rather than ideal sampling, from a pulse sample version of x, of x, namely z, you can get x of z back by putting it through a low-pass filter. Okay, so in practice, this is kind of what people do. In fact, I'll get to you in a second, Will. In fact, they don't pulse sample x, they sample x and then they send a pulse with constant height equal to that sample. And then you get an even further level of approximation. But anyway, Will, you had a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just going to be T over A. You're right. Thank you. Or T over little a. That keeps the A because A was the original amplitude of X. Usually I do this with a 1 up there, which is why I was trying to carry an A to be perfectly general, but you know that when you try to be perfectly general, you're always imperfectly general. Okay. All right, so that's pulse sampling. Fair enough. Now notice that if... A is really small relative to T, then this signal Z has a lot of dead space in it, right? That little a. Yep. You want to have the big A left over because XC hat has a, an A in it, big A in it. Oh, little a. Yeah, if little a is much smaller, way smaller, the smaller you make little a, the narrower the pulses in pi, the narrow, narrower the little pieces of x that appear in z, and therefore the more dead space there is in the signal z. Right? So that encourages us to think of an interesting way of solving a kind of a multiple access problem. Okay, suppose, so note... A much smaller than T implies that Z contains lots of dead space. And for that reason, we can do a multiple access kind of thing in the time domain that's kind of similar to the multiple access thing in the frequency domain we did for amplitude modulation with frequency division multiplexing, and that's called time division multiplexing. So we use that to solve... The multiple access problem that goes like this. I just heard someone yawn, which is okay. But it reminded me of this, this YouTube video. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Hotel professor going ballistic. Oh. <laughs> you seen that? I felt so sorry for that guy because, see, whoever, whoever was the, the student taking the videos of the class clearly leaked that to the internet, right? And that's the ultimate in betrayal to me, you know. Like if you, if, 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 if the video note guy, one of several comes to class, if, if they went, if there was a disaster in class or something, and then all of a sudden I found out it had gone viral on YouTube, I'd be pretty upset, you know. So that guy was, I, I don't know if he's a good sport or what, you know. He did. That, that guy. I, know, I saw a hotel professor died, but I, wasn't, I didn't know it was that guy. Oh, that's too bad, but I probably shouldn't have brought that up. What, what's that? What's that? I think he ended up taking it to Sprite, though, when he Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. That's good. Okay, the story is there was, there was a video of this professor in class in a hotel school. It's clearly a hotel class because he's in the Statler. 
and he said something like, "Where did that loud yawning come from?" You know, and he he, kind of, he ended up going back in the room and you know, like saying, "If, if why do you even bother coming?" or some, you know, that kind of thing. And then he says the the classic line in there is is um, something like. My unpleasant side is just as unpleasant as my pleasant side is pleasant, or something like that. You know, so, so. so, these X's should all be XC's, by the way. But anyway, just so before I erase them all. Anyway. Okay, so what's the multiple access problem? The multiple access problem is you have a bunch of agents, say capital N of them. So N agents want to send their individual XCs. So you know, agent one has its signal, agent two has its signal, and so on up through N. Simultaneously, over the same channel. And it, in this case, instead of thinking of the channel as being a filter, like we did when we talked about frequency division multiplexing, think of it as like a pair of wires, a twisted pair of copper wires, say, in the, in the landline phone network. Okay? So think of this as just a wired connection. And let's assume that all of these XCs have a common bandwidth, omega m star. So we're going to assume all the XCs are band limited to within some common bandwidth omega m star. And that's certainly possible if they're all band limited. We just take omega m star to be the max of all their bandwidths. And that, that'll do. What do you do? What you do is you share the channel, but you share it in time rather than in frequency. So the solution to this problem is to share the channel, share the channel by essentially alternating agents, cycling up through the N agents and then cycling through the N agents again by, quote unquote, interleaving pulse sampled versions of the individual XCs. And I'm going to draw a picture when n equals 2 to show you what I'm talking about. So for example, say n equals 2, and your xc1 of t, one user signal looks like this, something like this. And the other ones, just to make sure we can see the contrast, looks like this, is xc2. Looks like that, something like that. Then. What happens is the Z that is constructed from these two looks like this. Piece of XC1 and then a piece of XC2 and then a piece of XC1 again. And I'll shade these in a second to make sure I've got them. And the same thing going on over here. This is going to be a piece of XC2, so it's going to be way up here. And then a piece of XC1. It's going to be like down here, and so on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shade in the pieces of XC2. Everybody see that? And clearly, if you have end users, you're going to you're going to you're going to have you're going to cycle through the end users. One 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up through n, and then again. And I'm going to draw a little a diagram of a switching system that does this. So for the n equals 2 case, you can envision this as happening as follows. You have xc1 coming into one terminal and xc2 coming into the other terminal and you have a switch like so that goes back and forth between them and it forms z and essentially what the switch does is the switch dwells on x1 for time little a if those pulses are with little a then it switches and in that picture it switches sort of slowly so there's some dead space where there's no signal going into the switch over to x2 and dwells there for time a then switches again slowly back to x1 xc1 etc So that's how you create the signal Z. And if you had N users, you would create the signal Z by cycling through the N. So for N, N agents, what you do is you cycle through them. XC1, XC2, dot, 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 up through XCN, and then back to XC1, XC2, dot, 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 XCN back to XC1, etc. So that's how you construct your Z. From Z at the other end, we want to make sure that whoever receives it can recover each of the XCs, each of the individual transmissions. And to make that happen, we need to have a certain condition on how far apart the samples are, the, the pulse samples are. So the received, the receiver of Z can quote unquote unpack Z into pulse sampled versions of each signal, XC1, XC2, and so on. To be able to recover the actual XCs from those pulse sampled versions, so to be able to recover each XC from its pulse sampled version, what do we need? We need to have the individual pulse sampled versions be pulse sampled fast enough with respect to the common band with omega m star. In other words, we need the distance between consecutive pieces of each XC, so piece of XC1 here and then a bunch of other users' pieces and then another piece of XC2. We need this distance to be so that 2 pi over it is bigger than twice the bandwidth. So we need that 2 pi divided by the time between pieces of xcj, or let's just say xc1, 
is bigger than 2 omega m star, and the same for all the others, 2 pi divided by time between pieces of x, c2. That has to be bigger than 2 omega m star, etc. So, so that's what you need to do if you want to interleave users like this and get all their pulse sample versions through. So thus, the condition is going to be on the time between adjacent replicas, not the time between individual users' pieces. Yeah? What's the value of, you say, using pulse sampling instead of just having that be just a discrete signal? Well, it's, it's just sort of it, like... It, it's in a way it's easier to implement because you don't have to like measure something at an exact time. You know, you can just use simple switching systems. This is the this is actually the way that the landline phone system works, except the signals that they're transmitting are pulse coded signals. So they're they're always they always have value zero, one, or minus one, but they're continuous time signals at base. They're going through wires in continuous time. Everything here is continuous time. So we don't have to digitize, we don't have to use a computer, we, you know, whatever. Okay. okay. And, and there's all kinds of terminology associated with this. Like, like if you divide time into the pieces that each agent is using, so if I think of time as a big thing and say, in this case, agent one is using the unshaded pieces of time, the union of all those is called agent one's TDM channel. You know, there's all this kind of, you know, terminology that goes along. I'm not going to dwell on it because it's, it would just take us too far afield. Okay. And one cycle through all the users, so a piece of users, one signal, piece of user, two signal, and so on up to piece of user, end signal, that's called a TDM frame. You know, there's all these cool words, TDM channels, TDM. You heard these words before? Yeah, Jay's heard them. No. <laughs> Why were you nodding? I just nodding. Just nodding because... <laughs> yeah. All right. So we have TDM channels, TDM frames, and and you know if you look if, if you look up TDM chain frame, you know you'll you'll learn all kinds of good stuff about the landline line phone system. But anyway, anyway, ostensibly, and you know I'm always setting you up for disappointment when I say that, right? It means it's sort of like. If you, tweak, if you take a quick look at this, based on everything you know so far, it certainly would seem that, okay, that's, what ostent, that's why I use ostensibly, because it shortens that lengthy phrase. Ostensibly, what could you do here? What if there are, say, 10 to the 59th users, right? All I have to do is make A like T over 10 to the 59th, roughly, maybe a little less than that. And I can have all those users transmitting their signals, right? So it would appear that the capacity of a single channel is essentially unlimited here. You can put as many users as you want through by just shrinking A. So it would seem, it might seem, let's put it that way, that by shrinking A, remember, capital T is determined by essentially the, you know, the, the, these Nyquist conditions. By shrinking A, you could squeeze an unlimited number, arbitrarily many, users or agents pulse sampled signals into the same TDM signal Z and thereby have essentially infinite capacity in terms of how many whatever bits per second or whatever you get through this channel. Why can't you do that in practice? Think about it. Ricardo, what's your idea? You need like a zero inductance wire? 
Well, yeah, you have all, if, if, just think of the wire as being ideal, though. You know, so there's no, well, no, that's, that's part of the reason you can't do it in practice, is because these pulses don't go through cleanly. They, they end up coming, you know, sort of ramping up and ramping down, ramping up and ramping down. That's one thing that does happen, yes. They slop into each other if they're too close together. Dan. Yeah, you would need essentially a 10 of the 50 minus 59th accurate clock. That's another reason. And a, a further, let's, let's start listing these reasons. So this is impractical for various reasons, including but not limited to the, the channel, and this is the, the Ricardo, Ricardo reason, right? The channel sort of smooshes the, the nice, clean pulses in Z into each other. And does anyone know what the technical name for that happening is? If you think of a user's TDM channel, it's damn. Well, that's, that's a, more of a physics kind of term. I'm, I'm thinking of crosstalk. That's, that's the word I was thinking of. So they, they smoosh the nice, clean pulses in Z into each other. Okay, resulting in channel crosstalk, whatever. And the second reason was that you need clocks of incredibly high accuracy. And there are really good switches nowadays, as you know. There are switches that, that are, you know, you can switch on and off in a nanosecond. You know, transistors are getting faster and faster, blah, 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 blah. A nanosecond is how long it takes light to travel a foot, so it's really short, etc. But you need super accurate. Clocks and Will had his hand up. That's too far. <laughs> <laughs> we we need Zach for that one. You know, like uh, Nathan. Yeah, you can't really do delta functions. But okay, think of it this. Let me let me just. Uh, I'll the end. The here's a word. Noise. Essentially, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm getting at. See, there, everywhere in the world, in the universe, there's a noise floor, right? And if you shrink the width of these pulses without making them taller, which you can't really do because you can't make things arbitrarily high, if you shrink them in width without making them taller, your signal energy in each of these pulse sample versions is going to get very low. And as soon as the signal energy gets significantly below the noise floor, that's going to mess you up. Okay, so... So too small an A implies, so it's not just about the channel characteristics, it's not just about the clocking, it's also about nature. Too small an A implies that the signal energy in each pulse sampled, the, sig the total signal energy in Z won't be to, won't, won't be below the noise floor, but the signal energy in each of these individual pulse sampled XCs is below the noise floor, so to speak. So you can't really get reliable communication that way. But it's a great idea. It's, it's and electrons are discrete. I won't put that one down because it's too esoteric. So that's time division multiplexing. There's a small section on it in the monograph. I didn't, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it. I just want to give you the basic flavor of it. Right. So any questions about that? Dan. Could you use like a locking amplifier to get around this? What's a locking amplifier? I don't know that. I don't know what that is. I can't, so I can't answer your question. I could probably study it, but that would take class time. Yeah. Any other questions about the all the sampling stuff, all the sampling and interpolation and deconstruction equation and whatever else before we Ian? So for all the like frequently shifting like you make copies and like paste them along the spectrum, mm -hmm. we're assuming that are the signals that we're dealing with are bandwidth, right? Okay, that's a good question. 
because it, the answer is subtle. He, he asks, in all these pictures and equations we, we have that involve shifted scaled copies of a spectrum adding together in omega, are we always assuming that the signals involved are band limited? The answer is actually no. That the deconstruction equation, that infinite sum of 1 over t x c hat of omega over t plus k2 pi over t, that holds even when x is not band limited, provided that its sampled version has a DTFT. So think of it this way. Suppose x has a Gaussian type of spectrum. The tails are going to go to zero fast enough so those infinite sums will still converge. But all the replicas will overlap with all the other replicas. Get it? Yes. Yes. To, to get from a sampled version to the original continuous time signal, either with this pulse sampling or with the ideal sampling, the original continuous time signal has to be band limited. That's thing number one. Thing number two is it has to be sampled faster than twice its bandwidth. Right. And do not have right. Mm -hmm. So in order to establish that signal of bandwidth, we have to establish that it does not have finite duration, which would involve sampling for infinite time. Yeah. Obviously ridiculous. Well, well, actually, you know, it, this is all, all this stuff is in principle. Because to, to reconstruct the continuous time signal, you need samples for all time, unfortunately. And of course, in real life, you never have that. And you're leading well into the next piece of the class, by the way, by asking these questions. Like, for those watching at home, he's, he's, he said, if you couldn't hear him, that if you have a band-limited signal, which are the only kind you could ever reconstruct from sampling, then you, you would seem to have to sample them for all time to, to get the signal back. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's why the whole result says, in principle, you can reconstruct the signal exactly. So, you know, it's never exact. David. When you say a finite duration signal never is never band limited, is it because as it, when it starts and stops, that creates some sort of like really like uh, yeah. bizarre Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why is it? Why is it true that a finite duration signal is never band limited? Essentially, is what his question is, and and the and he gave the answer. The answer is essentially that to make it be zero outside of an interval of time, you have to add on quote unquote infinitely many sines and cosines and exponentials to get them all to cancel out just right. That's the intuition behind that. And I'm guessing the reason why this stuff works is because we just kind of disregard the, right? So that way we're able to get some sort of signal that has finite duration, meaning a message, let's say, right? It starts us up and we're still able to send it along as band We're pretending, yeah. Basically what we're doing is we're never getting the exact message back. We're just getting uh, Something close enough. That's that's all that's all there is to it. Because really, you know, if you're dealing with finite duration signals, they're never band limited. You know, and that's all there is to it. Any other questions about the sampling stuff? What? You worried about something falling from the roof? No, I don't fall. It's gonna fall off between us. What is it? Let's take a break and investigate this. Take the three minute break. Oh yeah, yeah. Hey. On this, I'm rewriting it completely and, and you know making the notation a lot cleaner and all that stuff. So, so it's going to look a little different in class from how it looks in the room or from how it looks when you read them, if you read the monograph. But there's sort of one overarching thing that's happening in the background here as we talk about these endpoint signals. And it's sort of like there's two parallel universes going on. One of the parallel universes is signals, finite duration signals and their spectra and all that kind of stuff. But the question we have throughout, and I want you to keep asking yourself this as we do this, because I'm going to try to sort of give you a one foot in each parallel universe as we go along. So throughout, the question recurs. How much is this about signals, spectrum?
spectra, etc. And how much is, quote unquote, just linear algebra? Okay, so that's the question I want you to keep asking. Why are we talking about signals? This is just linear algebra. Or why are we talking about linear algebra? Are we, ta are we trying to deal with signals and stuff? And you know, you can view all these different things, like you can view the time shift rule and the circular convolution rule and all that, as just linear algebra things that say that, that uh, the, this, this matrix gets diagonalized by this other matrix. You know. So you'll see as we go along, I hope. And so I might be tapping into a little bit of your linear algebra knowledge or lack thereof. Okay, how many people are really confident about their math 2940 mastery? To the level they required, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who is they for you? Who, who, who did you take it from? Uh, Terrell. Terrell. All these people, these are good people. You had? I have confidence. What about, did anyone have it from like uh, Ravi Ramakrishna or whatever his name is? I had it from like this Russian person. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, like we use it in physics all the time and I still mess it up. Okay, well, you know, if you want to you review your linear algebra, there's two really solid linear algebra chapters in the monograph, you know. Chapter <laughs> 4 <laughs> and chapter something teen, like 14, I think. One of them is called Linear Algebra 1 you know, vectors and linear mappings. The other one is called linear algebra 2, eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and all that. Okay. So if you, if you want to review, and then there's the SVD chapter, which is a separate issue. But anyway, but how much is just linear algebra? So, so anyway, again, we're going to assume all signals are complex valued. So a complex valued endpoint signal What is an endpoint signal? Is a signal x in c to the z. Okay, so it's a discrete time, complex valued signal such that x of n equals 0 when n is less than 0 and when n is bigger than or equal to capital N. That's what an endpoint signal is. It's a signal whose, that's finite duration and whose duration interval is included in 0 up through n minus 1. So that is to say an endpoint signal is a finite duration x in c to the z whose, whatever you want to call it, duration interval is contained in the interval 0, 1, 2, up through n minus 1. So it has at most capital N non-zero values. Some of the values in there could be zero, but whatever. That's what an endpoint signal is. Now clearly, the set of all endpoint signals is in one-to-one -one correspondence with CN. So here's the parallel universe description of endpoint signals. So obviously, the set of endpoint signals is in one-to-one -one correspondence with C to the N, which is the set of all complex N vectors, column vectors.
And the, the way we set up the correspondence is in the obvious way. Say x is an endpoint signal. The associated, and it, for this part of the class, uh, when I have a matrix or a vector, I'm going to underline it to emphasize the fact that it's a matrix or a vector. So the associated x in Cn is the vector x vector equals the vector whose first component, and this is where it gets annoying because we have both 1 through n and 0 through n minus 1 going on at the same time. So you have to sort of have your mind juggling between your C frame of mind and your MATLAB frame of mind. Okay? And I forget, what does Java use? Okay, so, so if you don't like C, Java. What is Python? Okay, so if you don't like C or Java, anyway. So clearly the set of all vectors of this kind is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a set of all endpoint signals. But an endpoint signal in signal universe is a whole signal that has a whole bunch of zeros. All right. Now, clearly, there, the end set of endpoint signals is a vector space. It's closed under linear combos. And the vector operations correspond nicely with those on CN. So note set of endpoint signals. is a vector space and in fact an inner product space and the inner product between two endpoint signals you can view them as L2 signals if you want because they have finite duration is the same as the inner product or maps over by this vector signal mapping to, this, to the usual inner product on Cn. So if x and y are endpoint signals, they're also in little l2. So their inner product, x and y, is going to be the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of n, y conjugate of n. And that, of course, is the sum is the same as the sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of x of n, y conjugate of n, because x and y are both endpoint signals. And that's the same as signal vector for y, Hermitian, times signal vector for x, where Hermitian is just conjugate transpose. Okay, so uh, what's going on in signal land and what's going on in complex vector land looks sort of the same. Parallel universes, again. Okay, first elementary operation you can do other than addition and linear combos on endpoint signals is what's called a cyclic shift. So an important operation on endpoint signals is cyclic shifting. And what you're supposed to think about here is an old school like video game, like Pac-Man or one of those. I mean really old school. Like the little guy goes out the right side of the screen and comes in the left side of the screen, right? You've all seen that. And do, do active shooter games have that kind of property ever? What, you go out the left side of the 
Well, suppose if you shoot out to the right, can you shoot yourself in the back of the head? Right. No. I've never played an active shooter game, so I... So, given an endpoint signal X, <coughs> so given an endpoint signal X and some N zero with zero less or equal to n zero less than capital N. C shift, that's going to be my notation, sub n zero of x, the cyclic shift of x by n zero. Is the signal that has specification C shift n zero of x at time n is equal to zero otherwise <laughs> and it's going to be something for the relevant range of times zero less than or equal to n less than capital N. And what do you think that's going to be? <clears throat> Using notation that we may have met before in some distant part of the course. Go ahead, Will. There's going to be a mod capital N in there for sure, but what is it going to be? It's going to be if it were if there were no if there were no C there, it would just be X of little n minus little n zero. Yes, it's going to be regular x of, now this is what you meant, I know it. it's going to be regular x of n minus n0 mod n, like so. Okay, let's, let's do an example of this. Notice that C shift n0 of x is another endpoint signal, and the way you obtain it is by rotating the values of x out by n0 and rotating those other ones in starting at 0. And I'll show you an example of that. So note C shift n0 of x is also an endpoint signal. And C shift sub n0 for any n0 is a linear mapping from the set of all endpoint signals to itself. do an example, but then I want to take advantage of the fact that it's a linear mapping to express it in a vector matrix kind of way if we view endpoint signals in a vector universe. So for example, if x is the five point signal that has x of 0 equals 7, x of 1 equals 13, x of 2 equals minus 3, x of 3 equals 11, and x of 4 equals 1. And what are its other values if it's a five-point signal? Zero. Then C shift sub 2 of x 
has values, let's call it y, has y of 0 equals what? What happens is I take these numbers, 7, 13, minus 3, 11, I skipped one. Didn't I? 7, 13, minus 3, 11, and 1. Yeah. And I, and I rotate them by 2. So 7 goes here, 13, minus 3, and then 1 and 11, like that. This is y of 0. This is y of 1, y of 2, y of 3, and y of 4. Okay. And you can check and see that, say, y of 3, which is c shift sub 2 of x of 3, is x of 3 minus 2, which is x of 1, sure enough. What about y of 1? y of 1 is x of 1 minus 2 mod 5, which is minus 1 mod 5, which is 4. There you go. Remember, it always goes 0 through 4, not 1 through 5. So y of 0 equals 11, y of 1 equals 1, y of 2 equals 7, y of 3 equals 13, y of 4 equals minus 3. Okay, so that's an example. Now the fact that C shifts of n0 is a linear mapping means that we ought to be able to express it in the vector universe as a matrix times the vectors corresponding with the signals. So in the linear algebra universe, Define the matrix Cn to be the n by n matrix that looks like this. In the first column, it's going to have 0, 1, 0, blah, 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 down to 0. Second column, it's going to have 0, 0, 1, down to 0. Third column, it's going to have this. You see the pattern. So it goes all the way down like that. And then the last column is going to be a 1 up here and zeros all the way down. And this one is going to have 1, 0, 0. So you get the pattern, right? It has 1's just below the, let me reset this one here so it looks better. It has 1's just below the diagonal. Or this has to be here. There. These are zeros. It has ones just below the diagonal, and then it has that one up in the upper right hand corner. So let me do C4 just for the heck of it, or C5. That's C5. Now I claim, I claim that that matrix implements the cyclic shift by 1 in the following sense. So under the sort of x to x vector signal vector correspondence we have the following we have that c shift 1 of x the vector associated with that by which I will indicate that it's a vector by putting an underline equals Cn matrix times the vector associated with x. 
and more generally, for all n zeros in the allowed range, the vector associated with C shift n0 of x equals this matrix Cn raised to the n0 power times the vector associated with x. Because shifting something n0 cyclically to the right is the same as shifting it to, cyclically shifting it to the right by one, then by another one, then by another one, n0 times. This is a power. OK, so we have a signal universe understanding of what cyclic shifting is, and we have a linear algebra universe understanding of what cyclic shifting is. And for all these things, we're going to be going back and forth between those two. Ricardo. Is that supposed to be C of n minus 1? Because if you have like, the identity matrix, and then you have C of 1, you have the shift of 1, and so on and so forth, it looks like? No, Cn is for endpoint signals. It's not shift of n. CN is the shift one matrix for endpoint signals. Okay. Get it? You nodded vigorously. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we're running over time, so we'll, we'll continue with this next time.